Hi, I'm Randall. You might know me as... Randy. Randy, where are you? Randy. Randy. Yeah. Hang out with Captain Q long enough, and you'll end up buying a boat. So join me as I navigate the ups and downs of owning an old sailboat. This week I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I was going to bring you the next leg of my journey south from Manchester by the Sea to Buzzards Bay, but I was just a little bit too excited not to share this with you as soon as possible. So I'm going to fast forward us to this current off season. If you've watched some of our past episodes, you'll know that Shannon boats rank up there as some of our favorites. We've looked at a Shannon 28, a Shannon 39, and a Shannon 43. All of them are beautiful offshore yachts. And the founder of Shannon, Walter Schultz, has been building and refining and innovating quality offshore sailboats since he founded the company back in 1975. And you don't have to take my word for it or Captain Q's word for it. Franck Maté, author of The World's Best Sailboats, wrote, Walter Schultz is the last of a wonderful breed, the complete boat builder. He designed boats and then builds them, always interesting and invariably one of the world's best yachts. I've been exchanging emails with Bill Ramos, who is the president of Shannon Yachts for a few weeks. And he told me that Walter was around, that I, I might be able to swing by and say hi. So I jumped at the chance to meet Walter and the rest of the crew at Shannon Yachts. Hey, hey how you doing, Tom? Right? Yeah, 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 how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Is yeah. Walter around? Uh, yeah, let me check. He's, he's in the back. All right, cool, cool. Hey, Walter. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for uh, letting me interrupt your day. <laughs> Welcome to the wonderful world of Shannon. Here we are in a my exhaust uh, invention here. I've got a patent on a uh, device, it's called RCI, uh, to take nitrogen oxide and some CO2 out of these engines. Wow. And we got an NSF grant to support us because the nitrogen oxide is just horrible, never mind CO2. But I need this for my amfoil, my electric hydrofoil project. You have got I'm a lot sure going on. I'm you wanted to ask that question of what am, I, <laughs> what am I doing now? I have a patent on it, we have a boat down in the water. This is, we brought up, that we're testing, modifying, changing. That begs a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah, it's more <laughs> questions than you even want to ask. I think I'm gonna to have to come back and uh, <laughs> ask you about more about it. You've been gracious enough to let me come interrupt your day and I was hoping if you have time to come swing by my boat, I'm just down the road yeah. and I could really use some coaching because I'm a yeah, rookie at this. I'll be happy, you know. I remember Henry Shields, I knew Henry Shields in a day. Well, what was your impression of Henry? He's a good guy, but he built some really nice boats. So I was probably on your boat at one of the Annapolis boat shows in the 70s. Yeah. Big boat, yeah. big arc. Ever heard of Noah's Ark? Ever heard of the Titanic? Later, where I really know him, is uh, he went into the shield keel. Did you ever use a shield keel nah, in Shannon? No, we didn't. Uh, number one, I don't do bolt hot keels. Yeah. It was a good idea. Yeah. So that was the harbinger of what became the wing keel on a Australian boat that took the America Cup. That's right, uh, Ben Lexon, is that right? Lexon, yeah. in 1983. Yeah. All right. So Henry was there, all right, but he was trying to do it just with lead and he couldn't, you know, it just didn't work. Yeah. All right. It saw what that, you know, you, yeah. I'm sure you've seen pictures oh, of yeah. what worked. Yes. All right. That didn't work, but he was on his way. He was looking for shoal draft, yep. all right, and to get, I eventually got a patent on something else in 2000 on a thing called the Shoal Cell to get rid of the center board. I that's, want to hear about that too. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, we built the bunch Now of, that you open the door, you might not be able to get rid of me. No, 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 you're always welcome here, you know that. And I, you know, I love what you guys are doing uh, with the show and everything and uh, getting people on boats. You can put in, yeah. you know, thousands of people on boats. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's just a wonderful thing. Yeah. Really is. If now's a good time, why don't, why don't we head down the road and... Yeah, I'll uh, I'll jump in a truck and I'll be down there and okay. give me 10 minutes. All right, all right, we'll just, see you down there. Okay. All right, so we're here at the boat. I got a couple of quick questions for you. Yes. I have 25 through hulls. Ah, that's an interesting number. I think I've discovered three or maybe even four of them are capped on the inside. 
um, but they're very close to other through holes, so they wouldn't, you know, patch them over because there's not enough distance. Not enough room. Right. Okay, get a back block. If you own this boat, are you concerned with, say, 22 through holes being uh, a safety issue? Is it something I should prioritize, make it a higher priority to, to try to patch over some? Well, let me tell you, you know, you can't say 25 or 23 through hulls, holes in the bottom of a boat and not say there's a little safety issue here, right? You know, that's, that's Swiss cheese here we're talking about, right? In the day, these are bronze seacocks, quality stuff. Yep. I've got a 92-year-old boat sitting down the street. I still got some original seacocks in that boat. So, yes, it's a safety issue, but the bronze through hull itself is not. Yep. If you're not using it, and I don't know what the hell you're doing, with 19, <laughs> see, what could you be running in here? It's a cruise ship. How many would you have on a, like a Shannon 43? If I had nine or 10, I'd be gasping. <laughs> we had a cruise ship here with 50 people on it. I don't know what the hell we're doing with all this. So the bronze itself, okay. all right, is okay. All right, if you're not using them and they're capped properly, yeah. that's okay. All right, you have to look at them. But what is an issue? is the hose clamp and hose going to it. Okay. All right, the other ones you're using. Yep. And they have to yep. be able to close. Okay. Now, these are very easy to free up. Yep. They made them. It's just a nut, bang, bang with a hammer, or you go like that, you get some lithium grease, waterproof, boop, boop, and you're done. Okay. Got a center board. Uh, when I'm when I'm tacking, she likes to have the center board down to really tack properly. If she, if I don't, it, yeah, no it, kidding. I get, I get that's back. why that's why Henry put it on. <laughs> Henry Shields. Uh, What's your feeling on this? It's another point of failure. Failure. It's another contraption, or it's another item that can mechanically go wrong. It used to be electric. Now it's not electric anymore. Good. <laughs> um, electric doesn't work. Yeah. I had to confront center boards in 1980. Yeah. Did not want to because I had such bad experiences when I was working in bull yards all right, with these things. Uh, what were some of the bad experiences? There it is. It's finding the pin. All right. You know, if you can't find a pin, that's how I met uh, first time Henry Hinckley. All right. Uh, there it is, right there. All right. That's, that's a godsend from Henry Shields. It's like a uh, birthday present. <laughs> All right, he sent you a birthday present with candles to have that. All right, because what happened in a generation after this, or even during this, uh, Henry Hinckley, Bermuda 40, you can't, there's no, you can't see it. All right, he buried it in a two piece hole. The guy backed the Bermuda 40 onto a pile of rocks, drove as a bronze board, drove the board right up through the cabin saw. And I, I took the job thinking I could fix it. And I said, I can't do it, I'm stumped, uh, it's, we gotta get somebody else. How long did it take you to get to that uh, decision? That you could About have? a week, uh, and they don't wanna hear it. So they paid me to drive uh, to Southwest Arbor, and I met the man. I don't think he said hello or goodbye to me. He just went like that, following him. We get into the glass shop, and there it is. Two halves of the mold, the whole centerboard well contraption. As soon as I saw it, I turned around, he was gone. He didn't say goodbye, nothing. <laughs> but he showed me the way. Yeah. Everybody looked at fiberglass as cheap production junk. Henry Hankley saw it as a superior material to wood. And he was right. He was right. And he taught me. Everything Hankley did, I followed. Except building yacht club boats. Because, you know, I don't look like the yacht club uh, material. And there was a hole in the market, yeah. you know, for offshore around the world boats, West Sail Tech. Yeah. And there I went, you know. It's a little cold out, so why don't we, uh, why don't we go up, up top where I've got a little heater and I'll, I'll toast this up a little Sounds bit. Sounds good, you know. Uh, we'll have some coffee and uh, get the chill out of the boss. All right, sounds good. And I thought maybe I'd get some feedback from you on how you think I'm ranking my priorities. And there's a couple of other things I'd love to get your feedback on. 
as to whether you think it's worth the time or effort to try to make better. But so my, this is how I've come up with my priority list. Um, number one, stop stuff that's leaking. Yeah. So whether that's the boat or things that are getting, you know, if there's water getting inside the hull, I have a, a leaky toll rail, which I know you have uh, engineered Shannon's not to have a leaky toll rail. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Christ, this boat has got to be, what, pushing 50? Yes. Yeah. I'm a little old, but I'm look at the shape I'm in. <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, you know, the, the one thing on a boat is uh, never say never. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and I'm sure anybody uh, watching this thing, all right, that owns a Shannon, you know, they'll be sending me email about their leak and toll rail, now that we mentioned that. Yeah, All right, yeah. so, that's gotta be low on your priority list, right? Well, yes Is it no. irritating you, why? Yeah, it's it's putting a decent amount of water into the bilge, fresh water into the bilge. Really? Yeah. Well, that's a different story. Where's the leaking wood? Right here. So, that pool actually drips water. Oh. Right down. Why you took the nut off it? No, it was never there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. Well, that's that's about as easy access. That's actually no problem. All right, because that chuck is fitted on top of the tow rail. Yeah. Right, it goes down like that. Yeah. Right. So it's just a question of freeing those uh, bolts right there and pulling the chuck up. Easier said than done. Right. You have to finesse it with a bar, all right, so you don't want to crack the, the toll the rail as you're coming yeah. up. But Christ, it's leaking that much, though. It, the way it is. Would there be something else that would be leaking more? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, like that chain plate. Yeah. It's hard to believe, you know, and you'll see what I'm talking about when we pop that truck off, the truck yeah. off that you're getting that much water. It's it's a pretty slow drip that comes off that nut, and then what I end up in the bilge, I end up with, you know, a gallon or two or three. Over what after period of time? Rainstorm. Oh, really? Yeah. With a boat? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not like a house or an automobile or even a uh, airplane for that matter. Uh, things, yeah. I've never failed to be surprised. Yeah. That chain plate right there is a big suspect. Yeah because it's always microscopically more yeah. so, uh, sure. constant. constant. Yeah. The, What's usually the issue there? Is it just the bedding? Yeah. yeah. Well, the bedding is dead. Yeah. 50 years. Yeah. Bedding goes south 20 years. That's about the the limit with, with uh, bedding. Well, you got you see the plate? Yeah. You're gonna pop that, yeah. clean out all the old junk, yeah. put it down. So engine coolant, I measure it before I start the engine and then go out for a two hour cruise and then I look underneath the engine and now I've got a oh, half gallon. So you, you don't you don't see where it's coming no. out of? Oh, okay. So I've got to find the leak in the engine and in order to do that, I was looking at it and just like can't, you know, underway I can't see. Uh, it's, it's just too dark. I'm making it into a slightly bigger project which is to clean up the engine room and to light it up with lighting and new sound dampening and sound deadening. Let's to get freeze plugs on the side of that engine. All right. Okay. Uh, every engine. Yeah. All these iron blocks have freeze plugs. Okay. What's it's a that? Little round, it's a little round thing okay. jammed right in to the side of the engine, mostly the copper okay. and an iron block. Those fail. All right. And uh, when the engine's running, What's the purpose of the freeze plug? Before this, there was no antifreeze. I'm old enough to, I came in on the tail end of antifreeze, we okay. used an alcohol. My oh, father was, okay. right, in cars. And the winter you put alcohol in the engine, you had to take it out in the spring, you know, yeah. uh, and put water back in, because okay. the alcohol would overheat the cars. That's the most likely spot. I'm using the engine leak as a motivator to clean it all up and learn it, learn what wire goes where, what's broken. I mean, a lot of my gauges don't work, so oil pressure, oil temp doesn't work. Um, my my fuel senders don't work. I have the tank tenders that don't work. Uh, so, well, uh, 
but they never do at all. <laughs> Thank tenders. That's another idea that came and went. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a good idea on paper. I mean, I never used them, but yeah. everybody was using them because they looked good at a boat truck. So what do you use in lieu of that? Two wires later on, three. All right. Just go to the gauge. Okay. All right. It's an impedance, imp impedance yeah. Yeah. Uh, gauge. All right. And there's a little little floaty on a goddamn thing. This concept of pumping air yeah, and you're yeah. gonna feed back air pressure. I mean, it was good for a laugh for me uh, <laughs> and all the guys. You know, there were boat grunts like right, me right. in the boat yard business. You know, you see those things, you just left. Is that something I could retrofit onto this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's little number uh, 14 gauge uh, wine. Yeah. Oh. Nothing. Oh, easy. Oh, easy, easy. While I have you here, this is a little bit off our topic. You're, you're standing above one of the tanks. It's a 125 gallon tank on port side, 125 gallon tank on the other side. It's a water tank? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, diesel's under here. Um, as I've gone through and started to organize and get things labeled, I, I realize I can't get down in the bilge and it kind of bothers me that it's 39 inches deep and these giant tanks are in my way. I don't have an inspection port on the tanks. Do I need with with modern day water makers? Would it would there be any sense in putting in two smaller tanks that give me better access to the deeper parts of the bilge, and then having a water maker somewhere on board if I really want to go on offshore passage? Well, if you if you're working with an unlimited budget yeah. and have nothing else to do with your life, all right, yeah. and are totally bored. That's a real good plan, all right, all right. But I think, you know, my fast glance yeah. around this boat, uh, I don't think that's on a list right now. Bigger fish to fry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. like keeping this thing floating and yeah. uh, uh, water out and so forth. Yeah. That's a monumental job, all right. all right, with damn little return so you can look down on a bilge on occasion yep. with your flashlight or your movie camera here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't want to be crude here. Talk about bursting balloons here. Diesel tanks. I've got 50 year old diesel tanks, yeah. right? I have not dug into them. I'm sure there's all kinds of creatures and bio bugs, right? You bet. The whole bottom of the tank is coated with, and it, it's it, it's a living creature, by the way. Yeah, it's amazing right. stuff. It's, yeah. You know, I've seen it, you know, cutting tanks open and stuff, pulling them apart. Boats that were coming up out of the Caribbean in that period, those were all uh, black iron tanks, yeah. you know, and it's a nightmare. Yeah. Because when you get in the sea, all right, the stuff breaks off. Yeah. All right, and it gets up into the strand. So we were cutting them tanks out, you know, uh, with with tax laws. Yeah, sure. they could be fifty fifty two the tanks. Oh, here we go. One right there. So seventy five gallons. Yeah. And that's my port. There's one right next to it on the starboard side. Well, I could see that Henry gave you easy access to get them out. And sarcasm is like a second language to me. Interesting, stock tanks in a day. Need a tour or something? Yeah, forget it. Nah, you ever talk to it. No, not, <laughs> not, not a hammer. There's a lot of jobs in this boat that need a big hammer. This isn't one of them. Oh, look at this. We got a fairy cushion. <laughs> well, it's not black iron. That's good. It looks like it's stainless, but it could be 50. 50. 52 aluminum. Uh, that's a break. This black iron by now is past its useful life. Uh, although my old Elko, which is 92 years old, uh, had black iron tanks in it for 70 years before wow. I pulled them out. These are high and dry, which is good. Is there any access in the top of this tank? No, you're looking at it. You ought to get rid of that clear plastic hose too, by the way. This one? Yeah, what is that? Is that copper or is that... 
Yeah, it's copper. All right, good. That's good. Copper's good. Okay. All right, copper is good. I don't know how the hell to get that stuff out. There's hard, but you could be creating more problems yeah. than not. Am I better off just setting up a fuel polishing system? Yeah. What you're really better off right away is uh, set up a good ray core. Yeah. Then micron ray core. Yeah. That's and what then, I've got. Yeah. yeah. And then get on with your life. The nice thing about a ray core is when it clogs, it shuts the engine off. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So try to catch it before it shuts off. Yeah. All right. But if you have two ray cores with a flip over switch. Right. Right. You just crank it. If the motor starts stuttering, yeah. you just run down. Boom. Do you find any of the bio? Diesel products work at all as far as cleaning out the creatures? Actually, they do if you start it before the boat's 50 years old. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a brand new tank, yeah. works like a chump. Yeah. Sure, how much of that you want to break up anyway. Right. The other thing you have down there is water. Yeah. Now, that we can get out. Yeah. Stick a uh, pump down there, yeah. and you're going to pump out about a gallon of water that's laying in there. And that goes right to the bottom? Just settled on the bottom. Yeah. Especially when the boat's stationary like yeah, this, yeah. you know. If you put water, we put a glass on this counter, yep. all right, diesel, and we put a half a cup of cold, uh, water in there, and wait five minutes, you're looking at it. Down. Okay, so maybe that's something I should do while it's on the hard. Which Just push a hose all the way to the bottom. Yep. One of those little bronze hand pumps. You know, yep. now the rake will also trap the water, so yeah, yeah. you can see it in the glass yep. in the bottom. All right. Yeah, I've been fortunate. I've always seen sediment come up through the ray core. I haven't seen any water. Yeah. May not be water. So, uh, you never know. This is supposed to be fun. Yeah. All right. It's not your day job. Right. It's kind of my day job, but it's not my day job. I never had a day job anymore since I started training. I've never worked again for my rest of my life. You gotta lighten up here a little bit. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> Too tense. Yeah. This has got to be fun. Yes. All right. So the work has to be fun yeah. and productive. Yeah. But before productive, it's got to be fun, challenging, interesting. Yeah. You know. I, and I, you know, I see all these postics here, <laughs> and it makes my heart palpitate. <laughs> you yeah. know, because I, you I, start I, pressurizing yeah. yourself. Oh, I think this is fun. I, I, I think that I, it checks both boxes for me. If the Puzzle. postics are fun and interesting, yeah. great. Yeah. As long as they don't start drilling your brain. Yeah. I've taken 18 derelicts right before the tra wood boats now. Boats, yeah. I've five of the last. And I love it. All right, that's been my hobby forever. Way before shooting, actually. And, uh, but it has to be fun. It has to be interesting. No deadlines. No customers, yep. no Memorial Day, <laughs> none of that. You can't, okay. you know, and uh, it, it, it's been a fascinating life for me. We may all be gone, yeah. all right, but this boat won't be. Yeah. I um, spent a lot of time daydreaming about what could be. What yeah, be that's fun. That's the fun, that the fun part. Yeah, I know that. It's. I got a couple of things on this that um, I'd love to get your your feedback on. A couple. This is the one I want to talk to you about back here, so. Okay. So this is a little bit of a spoiler. I was going out for a sail with a friend and we came back in and everything seemed great. As I was buttoning up the boat, I looked in the bilge and I discovered a whopping 20 gallons of salt water in the bilge. And there were no through holes that had any sign of any kind of water intrusion. So after a few hours of trying to figure it out, I took a look at my stuffing box. And sure enough, it was dripping fairly consistently, a few drops every second. And when the shaft is rotating, it was really spitting off a lot of water. So I probably took on closer to 40 or 50 gallons, but my bilge pump did as much work to, to reduce it down to 20. My boat has a relatively new system called a dripless stuffing box. The transmission is on the left with the adapter coupling, and then you see the drive shaft. There's a rotor that's mated to the drive shaft with a few set screws, and that mates with a water-cooled flange, and that interface between the flange and the rotor is really critical. 
Now, the problem with this system, as I see it, is that interface, when worn, becomes catastrophic. Because I only motored for about two hours and took on somewhere between 20 and 50 gallons of water, I really see this as a deeply flawed system, and the consequences of a failure are really high. I've talked to a few other boat owners, and more than a handful have had similar experiences of taking on lots of water. I'm curious to hear from any of you if you've had any dripless stuffing box systems fail on you. And I'm also really interested to hear what Walter has to say. Well, so, <laughs> this little culprit. That's, it's the last gasp. That's what it is, a last gasp. All right, right before uh, you do an April 15th, 1912. They called her Titanic. You get to be Leonardo DiCaprio floating on a door. <laughs> this was such a terrible idea. This was a solution to a problem nobody was having. I mentioned that old Elko I have. Yep. That boat's 92 years old, and a packing gland, bronze part of it. It's all in place 92 years later. It's one of the few things I'd ever replaced on a boat. Didn't have to. That's got to go. Yeah. How many how, how many bilge pumps you got in this boat? I've got three. <laughs> you need 12 <laughs> if this thing lets go. So it did let go a little bit this summer. Yeah, I'll and bet it, it did. It dumped in uh, 17 gallons in two hours. It'll sink the boat. Yeah. All right. It's definitely last gasp. It's the last gasp right before you drown. Um, How hard a job is that to you to put in as a more traditional? It's a boat job. It's a pain in the ass because of the access. Yeah. All right. The hardest part of this whole job is the the coupling on the end of the shaft where it bolts to, to the engine. Yep. You got to get that coupling off. Yep. All right. And slide the whole shaft out. Yep. All right. Once you get that coupling off, it's easy. Okay. Then you pull the shaft with the propeller on it, or you, if it comes off with the propeller, because you gotta get the shaft past that right yeah. there. Put the hose back on, and on the hose, not this hose, it's got enough <laughs> clamps on it. Considering <laughs> the thing is gonna fail there, you got the 14 clamps on the <laughs> thing, and uh, that's not the problem. The problem is the inherent design flaw of that piece of junk. Well, you know, the other thing, well, look, if once the shaft comes out, that's the time to look at the, uh, the cutlass bearing on the shaft. Yep. Once it's out, you might want to replace that whether you need it or not. Right. All right. Because uh, it's easy once the shaft is out, and you can't do it with the shaft in. So you'll only do this job once in your lifetime. But it's got to go. You brought this boat down from Maine, huh? I did. Boy, the gods smiled on you. The gods smiled on you. Terrif terrifying, terrifying. Titanic, April 15, 1912. Ooh, ooh. This head is a direct overboard head. Seems like it'd be a good place to put in a holding tank. We want the biggest holding tank you can get in a boat yeah. that fits. Biggest and you want a stock one, yeah. all right? Yeah. So you got two issues. Yeah. When you're gonna measure the cubic inches, yeah. how much room do we have, and what the hell can we jam it? Yeah. Well, you can jam it. Yeah. They have different shapes, yeah. you know, stock shakes, some, yeah. some of them with cotton, you know, right. that oh, they yeah. could sell to all the production boat companies. Yeah. How, how big of a tank would you have on the Shannon 43? Uh, 20 gallons. Gallon. 20, okay. You know, 20. Okay. But I design a boat around to fit stock tanks. Yeah, right. It's a little different. Right. And you know, Henry Shill was not having, he didn't have to deal with that kind of esoteric nonsense. Uh, you know, we weren't paying any attention overboard this guy. So I've got these separated berths here, right? These boats? Yeah. Um, not conducive to uh, cuddling. No, pro cuddling, so. Here's a thought that I had. This space that we're standing in now would actually make a decent sized double if you had something that maybe folded out or pulled out this way. Uh, yeah, and there's an opportunity here too. So, I right. mean, this is an awfully big step too that you could put more storage in. I feel right, like there's a lot yeah, this is a, a crazy waste of space here. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, I have to think about it, but the answer is, of course, there is. Yeah. You know, Winston Churchill, 
Winston Churchill. All right. The key to every great problem you'll find, common sense. Yeah. And that's where we're at here. Yeah. This is a common sense solution, and yeah. there is one. Yeah. It just takes a little while yeah. uh, to uh, come up with it. This but is one of those ones that's fun for me to think about uh, as I do other things I like. But yeah, we can. I just did, uh, I really did. It was an insurance job uh, for Shannon on uh, the boat sunk 43. That's the boat that's actually at the shop now. We just finished it. And um, they were having difficulty, not, yet, not young folks like you getting into the Foley cabin that I designed 22 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those, uh, who was the jerk that designed this thing? <laughs> we can't get the hell in a boat, right? And then when I saw it, uh, I couldn't get in a bunk either. So it shows you what kind of genius I was 22 years ago. Uh, well, even last week, and I redesigned the thing. Okay. The slide out, yeah. all right, and blah, blah, and the step, and boom, they could get in and out. They were up a couple of weeks ago, and I field tested these folks were in their 60s, and um, it worked. Uh, and that's the same thing we have here. Yeah. You know, I really must have got tired when we got back here. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been known to do it, too. I said to these, to these real nice people that I own a 43. I said, you know, by the time I got to the bow of the boat, I was exhausted. Got a wet lazarette with no yeah. gaskets, no <laughs> clamp down. Yeah, I see that. Uh, okay, we got something else here, though, besides a wet lazarette. You have what they call in a boat business a bomb. <laughs> it's a bomb. Yeah. It's Hiroshima. All right, I'm going to touch this very carefully. Oh, you got to disconnect it? Yeah. Oh, Jesus, don't. Try to make me coffee in this boat. All right. Oh my God. You know, this is a bomb. It's not a propane locker. It's a bomb. Oh my God. Now, this is a bomb. Uh, look at the size of this area. You realize if this fills up with gas? All right. You blow that building out besides the boat. You blow the whole transom out and probably yourself up. No, we do have. I did discover a couple of. Uh, I guess you call them drains, but a couple of little weep holes. That, that's the right word, is the word weep, because you're going to weep when a boat blows up. <laughs> all right? That's not going to do it. This gas is going to dissipate yeah. all through here, and Christ knows what could have knighted anything. Wow. And if you want to add some insult to injury, he put the um, solenoid here in the wet locker. I see it. And then you've got a cottage cheese container. Yeah, I see it. I'm looking at it. For, obviously, that went here, yeah. and I kept the water from the... No oh. Yeah. <laughs> Hiroshima. We got a bomb and a sinker. Oh, Jesus. This is no problem. Yeah. We can make a gasket. Just put a piece underneath here. All right. What, a what about clamping force to, to make it tight? Well, that's what that we're going to do with this. Yeah. So that's not a problem. All right, just modify that a little bit. And then underneath here, well, you see, in defense of Henry, there was no propane when this boat got built. Really? Coast Guard. Oh, would you use alcohol? You had to. You oh. couldn't get insurance. All right, and what a nightmare we had. Yeah. I was in two boat fires, both alcohol stoves. So was everybody. All right, China number one, when I built it just to get it, to Annapolis, I had to put an alcohol stove, and then down in Newport, lighting the stove to make some coffee, I set an employee on fire. Uh, I did it, not badly though, but it was good for a laugh. Did you a decent bonus that year? No, no, it was good for a laugh. In the big bell-bottom pants dragging on a thing, and the thing was leaking alcohol. I lit the stove and it set his pants on fire. It wicked up his leg. Laugh, oh Jesus. And I was shooting him with a fire extinguisher. We'll put another piece yep. underneath here, cut, you know, to fit. Put a, a half inch or more strong uh, uh, gasket yep. all around. And then when you drop it, push down, to, 
and I said, we'll find the latch. And it's called not a latch, by the way. This would be called, you want to stay with the nautical nomenclature nonsense, it's called the dog, D-O-G, like that stuffed dog you guys carry around. <laughs> All right. It's actually a pretty decent job, though, you know, for 50 years ago. It, doesn't have, it really doesn't have that much rock in it. It's a pretty neat little cockpit back here, though. Okay. Well, most of all, it, it puts you by yourself with a nice book. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I like to sail alone. I like to sail at night. My wife doesn't. All right. So I sail alone at night. What do you like s s about sailing at night? What is it, what is it it's about peace. It? It's quiet. Um, it's solace. Um, you know, it's amazing how many people never experienced that, you know. It stars, it's yeah. never crowded. There's no power boats coming along to blast me with a I'm wake when I'm doing four knots, you know. It's just wonderful. I can't imagine my life without it, you know. I only, you know, a couple of times a week when I really tense up. My wife hates it. I don't by myself. I don't have to talk to anybody, you know. Um, and it, it's sad to me when I'm talking about that now with you, uh, how many people never get a chance to experience that? Yeah. Uh, you know, no city lights, stars, sky full of stars, you know. Um, and you know, you're moving at three knots, you're moving at four if the wind's light, who cares? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not going anywhere, you know. It's uh, a wonderful thing, you know. One of your favorite memories of sailing. Oh yeah, it's at night. It's always at night. Is there a particular night that stands out in your yeah. memory? Yeah, we were coming out of Annapolis, and we got in a Annapolis three or four o'clock in the morning. We got this cold though. I had a jacket on like this, cold like this, coming out of Annapolis in October, and it was a meteor shower. All right. And, I, you know, and once again, I was in the cockpit alone. I had the crew down below, and all of a sudden, bam. All right. It was just shooting stars everywhere. Joshua Slocum said there are no infidels, that's the word he, at the time in 1898, there are no infidels at sea. Every met non-believers. Because if you don't have any religion, you see something like that, you're going to get it quick. <laughs> you want to talk about feeling small and unimportant is when you see a meteor show. Yeah. Up in Maine, I got to see sailing uh, uh, Northern Lights. Yeah, we were just off of Bahama, and uh, in the dark, same thing, middle of the night. And that was really, you know. Uh, you know, I've seen it in Norway, I've been in Norway, but it's not the same when you're on land. But when I was on a boat, once again, by myself, and I didn't even know what the hell it was. I thought at first there was some kind of flares of fire, but there was nothing but open sea in front. And then I realized what I was looking at, and the sky, I mean, magic yeah. you know and yet all the people sailing that i've met 50 years very few sail at night it's crazy yeah. you know it's just wonderful if you like the chat with walter we've got some outtakes and some segments that were cut for time over on our patreon so head on over and check that out and speaking of patreon thanks to our patreon supporters without your support this production wouldn't be possible so as always thanks very much i want to give a special thanks to walter for taking the time out of his busy schedule to give me a, some straight talk uh, i want to thank bill and brett and tom and kevin and the rest of the crew at Shannon Yachts for welcoming me as a rookie onto the scene. <laughs>